Okay, hi everybody and welcome to the next in this series of screencasts on programming for psychology, data analysis and visualization. So in this screencast we're going to be looking at descriptive statistics, so how we can calculate them and um, some methods for visualization. So what we want to um, get out of today's lesson is for you to know how to create a figure with multiple panels. So last lesson we were looking at how we can make uh, figures in Python using views. So today we're going to expand on that and look at the, the common scenario where you want to make a figure with multiple components to it. Then we're going to look at how we can use Python to calculate some basic descriptive statistics and then look at a, a, a new figure type, um, a box plot. We're going to look at how we can create box plots to visualize distributions. Then we're going to look at this concept of bootstrapping, which is a, a method to uh, compute confidence intervals, and it's something that really um, becomes available once you're able to um, program your computer. So it's quite computationally intensive, but it's a useful method, method to know. And finally we're going to look at another figure type and this is uh, how to create error plots. So as you can see we're going to cover uh, quite a lot of ground in this lesson. So just a, a warning before we get started that it's, it, it's probably going to be quite a long, list, long lesson so um, feel free to, to pause it um, as, we, as we go through. Okay so as usual we're going to switch over to, to Spider to get started. So normally when we're thinking about the um, descriptive statistics and uh, visualization, we're going to begin by um, considering some data that you've gathered from an experiment. So here we're going to simplify things and instead of actually looking at uh, real data, we're going to simulate the kind of data that might have been produced by an experiment. So in particular, we're going to simulate the outcome of a between subjects experiment with three conditions or three groups and 30 participants per group. So each of the three conditions is going to be represented by normal distributions with different means and also different standard devi deviations. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, generate uh, this data and we're going to save it to a text file so that um, for the rest of the lesson we can just load up this um, text file to have access to some data. Okay so we start by as usual importing NumPy as MP. Now we want to define how many, this is our simulated participants in each group. So let's define a variable here, n per group to be 30. Now we want to set the mean of each group's distribution. So here we want to specify the mean, so we're going to do it as a list of group means equals, okay, so the first group or the first condition will have a mean of zero, second will have a mean of two, third will have a mean of three. So this is just arbitrary, but this is just a, a way of generating um, uh, three different conditions with, with different um, distribution properties. So that's the mean. The, the next thing we need to do is to set the standard deviation of each group and we're going to set it to be half, oops, half its mean. So we're going to have the, the standard deviations of each group to be another list corresponding to the each of the three um, groups and it's going to be half the, um, the mean of the relevant group. Okay, so now let's just compute a variable that just um, contains how many groups we have by looking at the length of the group means list. So n groups here will be three. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to make an array. So we're going to use an array to represent this data and we're going to call it data and we're going to start by initializing an empty array. So we can use this by the function np.empty and we give it the shape of the array. So we want it to be n per group, so we want there to be 30 rows and we want n groups as our columns. 
So this will generate a, an empty array with uh, 30 rows and three columns. So now what we'll do is we use this um, associated method called fill to fill it with a data type called nan. So nan stands for not a number. Basically we're saying create this empty data array and then fill it with just nonsense values. So um, we can then later on, once we think we've um, completely filled up our data array, we can check that there's no NANs left in our array. Okay, so now we start, we're ready to start filling this array up with some data. So let's loop over our three groups. So I group is going to be the index of the group. So in range of N groups. So I group will be zero, then one, then two. Okay, so each time in the loop, we'll pull out what the, the mean of the group is. Group means I group, and we want the group standard deviation as well. Group standard devs, I group. Okay, so now for this particular group, we've pulled out its mean and we've pulled out its standard deviation. So now what we're gonna do is generate some random random numbers. So we're going to call it group data equals np.random normal. So remember we're generating, we're assuming that these correspond to a, a normal distribution and we give it the location as the group mean, the scale as the group standard deviation and the size is n per group. So essentially what we're asking here is generate 30 values drawn from a normal distribution with a mean corresponding to this group mean and with a standard deviation corresponding to the group standard deviation. So now we've generated it, now we wanna store it. So in our data array, we wanna store it in all of the rows for this particular group equals this data that we've just generated. Okay, so now where we can finish the loop and now our array should be filled up. So let's just have a look at the first five participants. All right, we save that and run it. All right, so here we can see our first five participants. So participant one on, well, each, each group has a different set of participants. So, but um, the first participant in each group has had a 1.2, 3.1 and then 1.8. So we have altogether 30 rows and three, three columns. So as I mentioned, we um, first set each element in this data array to this value np.nan. So um, what we can do now is just to be, just to be sure that we've actually um, done what we thought we've done, we've filled up this array as we expected, we can use a new Python statement called assert. So what assert does it's a, it's a bit of a simple statement, so anything after assert uh, gets evaluated to a, a boolean, and if it, the boolean evaluates to true, then everything's fine and the program just continues. But if the boolean evaluates to false, then the program um, generates an error and typically stops running. So what we can do here is to check that we don't have any nans left in our array. So we can sum np.isNan data equals zero. So let's see what we're doing here. So this isNan takes our data array and converts each element to either true or false according to whether it is, has the value of NAN. And then what we do is sum them all together. So sum all the, the trues and we test if that's equal to zero. So if it won't be equal to zero, if there's any le NANs left over in our data. So we don't expect that to be the case. So let's save it and run it. And we shouldn't see any errors. Nope, we don't. So just to show you what it would, what it would look like, say for example, if we, um, when we initialize our array, we add, we have four groups rather than three. So as we go through our, this loop here, we never um, touch this fourth condition. So it'll never get anything uh, different from this NAN. 
So when we get down here, this should um, have problems and we'll see it complain. Yep, and there we go. You can see that we get this big angry red message saying that this assert line is no longer true. I'm going to stop execution. So this is just a useful thing to sort of scatter around your code whenever you think that there's a situation that should never happen if your code has been written correctly. Okay, so let's restore it back to where it was and we can continue. Okay, so now we've generated all our data. The last thing we need to do is save it. So we'll set a, a path and we'll set it to, let's call it pro data viz descriptives tivs sim data.tsv. Okay, so this will be our, our file name. And what we want to do is np.save, save txt, sorry, where we want to give it the data path. We'll give it our data. We want to give it a tab delimiter. And we'll just give it a, a header um, simulated data for the descriptives lesson. Okay. So now it'll save it into this particular file here. So now if we run it, okay, so now we will have a uh, data file called prog data viz descriptives simdata.tsv. So we can just have a look for that, change our data type. All right, so here we are. If we load it, now we have these uh, 30 rows, three columns, then we can then load in future um, um, scripts to have access to this data. All right, so now we've generated our data. Let's start up a new file. And the first thing we want to do is load the data we just created. So import numpy as np. Now data path was prog data viz derivatives sim data.tsv data equals mp.load txt data path and we'll tell it the delimiter equals tab and let's just make sure this is as we expect all right so if we save that and run it okay so it's been able to load that data back up and we're all good to go okay so the first thing we want to do with this data is to have a look at it so what we're going to do is um, use the histogram technique that we looked at in the previous lesson to visualize these three conditions. So we could do this all in the one histogram, but it might get a bit sort of crowded, a bit hard to see the different conditions. So instead we're going to make a figure that has multiple panels. So each panel is going to show a histogram for just one condition. So we're going to have these three panels aligned uh, vertically, and we can do this in, in views quite easily. But before we begin, so just to make things easier, we'll just pull out some properties of our data into variables. So n per group will be the number of rows. So remember that's contained in this uh, shape um, property of data. And we'll also pull out the number of conditions, which is in the number of columns. Okay, so the first thing we'll do now is, as usual, import views.embed. And we'll just start by setting up our page embed equals views.embed.embedded and we'll give it the name views okay as we've seen before we'll start by adding a page and we'll set it to have a width of one column so 8.4 centimeters and we'll give it a height of 16 centimeters so remember, we've got three panels, so this will need to be quite, quite high. All right, so let's just set ourselves up here with wait for close and we'll run it and just make sure that we're all good. Okay, so now here's the beginnings of our, of our page. Okay, so if you remember before, the, what we did was we added a, a graph element directly to the page. So what we need to do to make a multi-panel figure 
is to add an intervening uh, property called a grid. So we first add a grid to the page. Okay, so we do this by grid equals page dot add grid. So now we've got our grid. Now the grid has two particularly important uh, properties, the rows and the columns. So we need to set the number of rows will be the number of conditions we have and the number of columns is one. So that is when we have our, our final figure, we want there to be just um, three vertical rows of um, figure panels and just one column. Okay then, so now rather than adding the graph to the page, we then use um, the grid to add the graph, which will add uh, graphs to consecutive panels. So let's loop over our condition. We will add our graph, but remember we're adding it to using the grid now, not using the page. And we'll add some axes. Okay, so let's go over what we've done here. We first we've set up our page, then we've added, added a grid to the page, and we've told the grid that we want to have three rows and one column. Now we're looping over our conditions. Each time we're adding a new graph to the grid, and we're adding some axes to the graph. So let's save it and run it and see where we're at. Okay, so I've made a mistake here somewhere. Let's have a look at where it is. Okay, so we can see that the error is coming in on line 21 here. So if we have a look at line 21, we're setting the number of rows to be the number of conditions, which we get from this uh, shape. So remember from last time, views can be a bit picky about what uh, data type it expects. So let's just make it explicit by converting this to an integer. So now if we save that and run it, it should all be okay. Yep. So now we see our page, we zoom out, now we have a page, we have three um, rows, each with a different um, figure embedded in it. All right, so now what we need to do is to uh, fill up each of these figure panels. So because we're going to be making histograms, the first important decision we need to make are where we want the histogram bins to be. Because we want to be able to compare across the th three panels, it's probably a good idea for each panel to have the same bins. So one reasonable way we can decide on the bins is to calculate the minimum and maximum values across all of our data and set that as the bin extremes. And then we'll add a little bit of padding um, just to give it a bit of room. So we can do that by first calculating the minimum. So min val equals mp.min of the data, max val equals mp.max of the data. So this is going to be across all of our participants, across all of the conditions. Now let's define this padding that we talked about. So we'll add about 0.5 to the extremes. Now we want to set the number of bins, so let's have 20 bins. So now what we need to define is the bin edges and we can use a function called linspace to do this. So we'll define bin edges equals np.linspace. So linspace is going to generate um, some, um, a set of numbers between two points. So we want it to start at the min val minus the bin pad. We want it to go up to the max val plus the bin pad. We want there to be n bins, and we want the, it to include the end point, so the very last value. Okay, so now we have the edges of each of, our, of all of our bins defined. Now let's work out how um, wide each bin is. So we'll call this bin delta, and we can get that just by looking at the uh, distance between bin edges in the first index from bin edges in the zeroth index. Okay, so now to calculate the bin centers, remember we've been looking at the bin edges, 
the bin centers are the bin edges plus half of this bin delta. Okay, so we're going to be using this um, for each of our uh, panels. So let's tell views about it now outside of our loop using embed.setData and we'll call it bin centers and we'll give it bin centers. Okay, so let's go over what we've done here. First thing is we've worked out what the uh, lowest value in all our data is. And we've worked out what the biggest value in all our data is. Then what we've done is to find a set of edges for our histogram bins that go from the lowest value with a little bit of padding up to the um, largest value in having uh, 20 of these uh, different intervals and then we've calculated how large each bin is and calculated the bin centers then told views about them. So these bin centers are essentially going to set our um, horizontal axis. Okay, so now we're ready to, inside our loop, we can calculate our hist result using the np.histogram function. We give it the data for all participants for this condition and we also tell it the bin edges that we want it to use. Now this is going to return a list where the bin counts is the first element in the list. Okay, so now we need to tell views about this data. So the first thing we're going to do is give it a name. We're going to make a string that, um, that describes the bin counts for this condition. I'm going to call it bin counts. Then we're going to use this uh, formatting method where we say um, this variable i is um, formatted um, as an integer, which is d.format and we'll tell it that i equals the index of this condition. So now we have a way of identifying the bin counts for this particular condition. We can tell views about it, embed.setData bin counts string is the bin counts. Okay, so now views knows about the uh, number of um, uh, values within each bin for this particular condition. So now we can go ahead and add our bar graph. So we add a bar. Now along the horizontal axis we'll set this POSN property to be the bin centers that we defined up here. And we're going to set the bar lengths.val to be this bin counts string that we've defined for this particular condition. Okay, so now finally we're just going to do some of these uh, cosmetic changes that we went over last time that just to make our, our figure look a little bit nicer. So the first thing we'll, we'll hide the, the um, border. We want to use Arial. And we want to do some things to both the horizontal and vertical axis. So we loop over our axis. Call it current axis. So now first we convert it to Arial. Okay, so now we've just made a few of these uh, changes to look, make it look a little bit nicer. Okay, so let's save that and run it. Okay, so now we can see our, our figure come together. We've got our three panels. We can see our three distributions. So remember the means were one, two, and three, and the standard deviations were half of the mean. So you can see that becoming apparent now. There's a shift in the sort of central tendency of these three distributions. There's also a shift in the spread of these three distributions. Okay, something that is apparent in this figure is that this space here on the left-hand side and this space here at the bottom 
is a bit larger than what we require. So we can change this by um, setting a property of the grid. So in particular, we want to set a property called left margin. So let's reduce it down to half a centimeter. And we also want to set bottom margin. And we'll also set that to half a centimeter. Save that and run it again. Okay, so now you can see that we're occupying more of this, this space here. We've left a little bit that we can put a, an axis label in, but otherwise it seems like it uh, fits on the page quite nicely. Okay, so there are, there are a couple more things that we could do to improve the appearance of this figure, but um, I'll leave some of those to the exercises and we'll move on. Okay, so we've visualized these um, data distributions. So now what we're going to look at is how we can create, um, calculate some descriptive statistics that capture some aspects of these uh, distributions. So luckily this is pretty straightforward in, in Python. Let's get ourselves back to our previous state where all we need to do is import NumPy, load our data. Okay. So now what we're going to do is look at how we can um, calculate some of these descriptive statistics. So the first one we're going to look at is the mean. So let's do this all in a um, print the output. So we're going to print the mean and we're going to use the um, function np.mean. So this takes in our data. Now the most important thing we want to do here is to specify this axis argument. So this determines what over which um, dimension of the array that the mean gets calculated. So what we want to do is calculate the mean across uh, groups. So, sorry, um, within all the participants in one group. So this is, our participants are the zero axis. So now what we're saying is calculate the mean for all participants in condition one, mean for all participants in condition two, and mean for all con participants in condition three. Okay, so now if we save it and run it, all right, now you can see our output. For this particular uh, sample, the mean for the first condition was 0.9 roughly, mean for the second was 1.8, and the third was 2.7. Okay, so that's the mean. Uh, if we like, we could also do the median. So very similar, just instead of mean, we use median, again, with the zero axis. So they're just a couple of standard measures of, of central tendency. Let's also have a look at a couple of measures of dispersion. So the first one we'll look at is standard deviation. Now to calculate that we can use np.std. As before we give it our data, we give it the axis equals zero. But now for our purposes we need to do one more thing, and this is to set the uh, ddof to be 1. So if we have a look at the help for this particular function, we can see that it's going to, as we want, compute the standard deviation along a particular axis. Now this one we've set is this ddof. So what it's saying is that this is uh, the denominator, affects the denominator where it's n minus ddof, and by default ddof is 0. So if we were to use the default, the denominator um, used is n. But because we want to calculate the sample standard deviation, we want it to actually use n minus 1. So we can get there by setting ddof equals 1. Let's also have a look at the range. And here we can use a NumPy function called peak to peak or p to p. Again, we give it our data and the first axis. Now if we save it and run it. All right, so now as long as, as, along with the mean and median, now we've got the standard deviations and the ranges. So if you recall, the standard deviations that we actually used as the population was 0.5, 1, and 1.5. As you can see that they're, they're, they're roughly um, in, the, in the same sort of ballpark as those uh, figures. Okay, so now we're going to move on to looking at another uh, visualization technique for these distributions. And we're going to look at box plots. 
So box plots are, are a really uh, useful um, way of uh, visualizing uh, distributions, um, and we're going to use use those here. So again, we get ourselves back to where we were. We're going to use views again. Embed embed equals views dot embed dot embedded. Now we're going to at our page as usual so we want it to be uh, one column again and we only have one panel here so we can we don't need it to be quite as high so we'll set it to be uh, 10 centimeters high again so we only want one panel so we can add our graph directly to the page rather than going through a grid make our axes okay so now let's save it and run it and just check that everything's okay yep so we have our uh, figure here that now we're going to add a box plot into this region Okay, so the way we're going to do it is to actually add a different box plot for each condition. So there are, uh, there are different ways you can do this, but this is a, a straightforward approach. So we can loop over our conditions. And now for each condition, we're going to add a box plot. Do this by using graph.add with the box plot type. Now, as we did before, we need to specify the data for this particular um, condition. And again, we need to make views aware of this. So let's set a string to, for this particular box plot. Box data, again, ID. Okay, so now we have a string that's specific to this, the data from this particular condition. So now we make views aware of it. Okay, so now we've bound the data. What we can do is we can set its values to this string. So this tells views, okay, for this box plot, look at all the data for this condition. And then views internally generates all the, um, the descriptive statistics it needs to generate the box plot. And the next thing we need to do is tell it the position on the horizontal axis by this POSN property and we'll set it corresponding to the condition index. Okay, so let's save it and just see where it's looking at the moment. Okay, so now we have our figure and we have our three box plots. So it's looking a bit ugly at the moment, but in each of these box plots, the horizontal line is the median of that distribution. The cross is the mean. The, this um, box is the 25th to 75th percentile. These whiskers are 1.5 of this interquartile range above and below the 25th and 75th percentile. And any circles are, are individual data points that lie outside these whiskers. So it's quite a neat, neat way of, of seeing uh, the structure of these dis different distributions. But as I said, it's, it looks a bit ugly at the moment. So let's uh, first spruce it up a little bit. So this will be mostly using techniques we're familiar with by now. Uh, the first thing we'll do is one that's uh, not really familiar. We'll set the it's called the fill fraction. So this is going to change the width of our box plot of val to be 0.3. So now if we save this and just see what effect that had, you can see now that these boxes have sort of shrunken. So now there's a bit more room between each condition, which is nice. Okay, so now we're going to set some axis properties so we don't need to be inside the loop anymore. So for the horizontal axis, let's set the ticks, the major ticks, to be 
we'll define them manually and we'll set them to range and cond. Essentially what they're saying, what we're saying here is just put tick marks at 0, 1 and 2. Now let's hide the minor ticks because we don't really need to see them. And let's set a label. So let's call it condition. Okay, so now let's set some properties of the y-axis. First, let's give the um, min value a bit more padding. So min.val equals, remember we need to uh, call it, cast it as a float. Calculate the minimum of our data and we'll add a bit of a little bit of or we'll subtract a little bit of padding. We'll also give it a label. Of course if you're actually running an experiment these would be more informative labels. Now we're going to do the, the same sort of typical um, uh, formatting changes that we normally do. So firstly we'll hide the border Set our typeface Okay, so now let's save it and have a look at what um, effects these changes have had. Alright, so now our figure's looking a lot neater. We can see again these nice changes in our distributions. The means going from 1 to roughly 2 to roughly 3 and this increase in the spread of the distribution um, as we go from conditions 2 to 1 to 0. Okay, so speaking of 2 to 1 to 0, uh, one weird thing about this graph at the moment is that we have these um, numerical uh, numbers here on the x-axis where really what we're looking at now is a, a categorical um, property. So what we want to do then is replace these numbers with a string that gives some indication of what particular condition they correspond to. So the way we do that is associate each box plot with a label. So first thing we want to do is make a list containing what we want to call each condition. So I'll call it cond labels. And again, these will be informative if you're actually um, collecting data. Let's just call them C1, C2, and C3. So now we have a three item list specifying the label of each condition. Now for the box plot for a particular condition, we set its label to be cond labels for this particular condition. Okay, so now we've associated each box plot with a string that is its label. Now the last thing we need to do is tell the x-axis that instead of using numbers to um, indicate each tick, instead use these labels that I've given you. So we set its mode to be labels. Now if we save that and run it, can see, okay, I've made an error here. Okay, so the error is telling us that this widget node doesn't have an attribute or child called label. So the mistake I made is that this box plot property is actually called labels rather than label. Now if we save it and run it. Okay, so now you can see we've got the box plot up again. Now instead of these um, 0, 1 and 2, we've actually got some meaningful indication of what each of these conditions um, represents. Okay, so that was box plots. So now we're going to move on and have a look at another topic. So again, let me just clean our file. So now we're going to look at is the idea of confidence intervals. So often in, uh, when we're analyzing data, we're interested in the means of our distributions. 
and we often want to have a look at the 95% confidence intervals of such means. And the typical way we do this is by um, first calculating the what's called the standard error of the mean. So here we can do this in NumPy. So we can create a variable, we'll call it SEM for standard error of the mean. And what that is, is the standard deviation. Remember how we did this before, data axis equals zero and DDOF equals one. And we divide that by the square root of N per group. So this will give us the standard error of each of our, um, the means of each of our three conditions. Let's have a look. Save that and run it. Okay, so now we have the standard error associated with each of our three condition means. So now once we've got that, we can generate the confidence intervals for each condition. So let's loop over conditions. First, let's calculate the mean of the, this particular condition. So we don't need any axis argument now because by specifying the index of the condition, we're converting this data into a one dimensional array. And we can get the standard error of the mean from our SEM index, uh, list with the icon index. Okay, so now our lower confidence interval will be our mean less 1.96 times the condition standard error. Upper CI will be the condition mean plus 1.96 times the standard error. Now let's print that out. So now we want to print the condition. The mean is equal to, let's point it as a 0.3f, we'll print it out as a, a decimal to with three, three places. Well, lower CI, upper CI. Okay, so now we need to prov provide each of these um, variables that we've indicated here in the curly braces. So I will be iconed, let's do a plus one so that um, look look nicer. M is the condition mean. LCI is the lower CI. UCI is the upper CI. Okay, so now if we save that and run it. All right, so now we have the mean and confidence intervals for each of our three different um, sampled distributions. Okay, so that we calculated those using what's called a, a parametric approach. So now we're going to use a different non-parametric approach called bootstrapping. And this is a really computationally intensive, but really quite straightforward and really useful um, alternative method of calculating uh, confidence intervals. So the first thing we're going to do is just Let's just put those into a new file just so that we can remember what they are later on. And let's get ourselves back to where we were. Okay, so the key to bootstrapping is that we're going to perform resampling with um, replacement. So what we're going to do is randomly sample uh, participants with replacement. So a particular participant could, impe could appear in our sample data multiple times or it might appear not at all in a given sample. So let's have a look at how we can do this. So first let's just look at a, a quick quick example. So say we have 10 subjects represented in this list here from 0 through 9. What we can do is randomly sample um, different subjects. So random sub, let's just call it rand sub sample so we're going to use this numpy function called random.choice where the array that we're going to sample from is our subjects. We're going to sample with replacement and we're going to sample 10 of them. 
because in this example we've got 10, 10 subjects. Now let's print it out. Save it and run it. So you can see that this random subject sample here is it's generated 10 numbers. You can see that the first participant, this index 2, is appearing twice in this uh, particular sample. This uh, participant index 3 is 1, 2, 3 times, whereas um, there's actually no um, participant 4 in this particular sample. So what we can do then is once we have the sample, we can print look at the data from this random subject sample, say for the first condition. Okay, so now we have a, a set of data. What we can do is compute our mean of that data. Okay, so now we have a mean of this um, uh, distribution of where the participants were randomly sampled with replacement from the actual participants we had. So the key to bootstrapping is to doing the same procedure many, many times. So here we're going to use uh, 10,000 iterations, but if you're actually doing it, things like 100,000 are not um, unusual. So once we've done all these iterations, this gives us what we call our bootstrapped distribution, and we can then rank the values and look at the 2.5% and the 97.5% values to define our 95% confidence intervals. Okay, so let's look at how we might do that here. So now our subjects is going to be n per group. Now we want to define the number of bootstraps we're going to do, which is 10,000. As before, let's define an empty array that's going to carry our bootstrapped data. And boot, and we'll fill it with nan again. Okay, so now this is going to have um, 10,000 numbers in it. We want to loop over our bootstraps. Each time we want to generate a new random subject sample. The array is subjects. Sample with replacement, which is important. And we size this n per group. Okay, so for each of our 10,000 times, we can have a new set of uh, participants. Now we want to store the mean of the data with this random subject sample. And here we're just looking at the first condition. Okay, so now once we've filled up our boot data with 10,000 of these, we can look at the overall condition mean. We can estimate by the mean of these bootstrap distribution. Now the lower CI you can get using a function from scipy.stats called score at percentile. We'll give it the boot data and we'll say 2.5. Now we've got the same thing for the upper CI. So this time it's going to be 97.5. Okay, so we've used this um, new function here as part of scipy.stats, so we need to import that. And finally, let's print it out and have a look. And the index mean is then the 95% CI. Again, we'll set a condition. We don't actually index, uh, loop over condition here, so we'll just set it to one. The mean is our cond mean. Lower CI is lower CI. UCI is upper CI. Okay, so let's go back over what we've done here. So what we're doing is we're uh, saying let's do 10,000 bootstraps. We define an empty array with 10,000 uh, NANs in it. 
Now for each of these 10,000 bootstraps, we generate a random um, sample from our um, participants with replacement. Then from this data, from this random sample, we generate a mean and store that. So we end up having 10,000 of these means, which we then look at the mean of to establish the, ab the overall mean, and then look at the 2.5 and 97.5 percentiles to generate our lower and upper confidence intervals. So now if we save it and run it, it might take a little while to sort of churn away because it's doing 10,000 of these. You can see we end up getting our mean and 95% confidence interval. So if we compare, it's quite similar to the, to the means and the confidence intervals that we got using our parametric approach. But we've got it through this non-parametric bootstrapping approach instead. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is how we can uh, visualize these condition means and their associated confidence intervals using error plots. So we're going to use bootstrapped error plots in this example. So again, let's take us back to blank. Let's import views and we'll create at a page so we're just going to do one one panel again so we'll make it one column wide don't need it to be very high so we'll set it to be eight centimeters now as I said we only need one panel so we can add our graph directly to the page and we'll add some axes Okay, so now we should be all set, again with a blank figure, ready to create our error plot. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is to plot our means. So now we're going to use a, a new um, graph, views graph type uh, to do that, called XY. So again, we're going to loop over our conditions. First, we're going to calculate the mean as the mean of... as mean of the data for this condition. Again, we need a string for this condition to tell views about it. So we'll just have it call it cond. And we'll tell views about it. So the only um, unusual bit we need to do here is that this set data expects a collection, so a list or an array, whereas our cond mean now is just a single number. So we just need to put it in square brackets to make it as a list. All right, so now views knows about their mean, so we can create a graph type called xy. Graph.add xy. Now, the properties we need to set now, uh, it's x data, so it's position on the horizontal axis, which is going to be the condition index, and the y data, which is going to be this um, data string, which corresponds to the condition mean. Okay, let's save it and run it, see where we're at. All right, so now we have the, the basics of our condition means. You can sort of get a sense that there's a, a, a circle down here. You can clearly see a circle in the middle here, and you can sort of get a sense of a circle up here. So I've got a bit of work to do to clean up this figure. So let's do it. Um, most of this will be familiar. Again, we're going to use a um, strings as our labels rather than the numbers. So I need to set cond labels. Again, for our XY, we need to bind the labels. I remember to call it labels this time. Equals cond labels by cond. All right, so now let's give ourselves a bit of room. 
For the x-axis we need to set its mode to be labels. We'll set its major ticks to be manually defined. And we'll set them to be 0, 1 and 2. We'll turn off the minor ticks. We'll give it a label. We'll set its minimum value. So based on what we know about this data already, let's set it to minus 0.5. Let's give it a maximum value. And here we'll set it to, um, let's say, let's see, we, we, need, we know that it goes 0, 1, 2. So let's set it to 2.5. Okay, so that's our, hor our horizontal axis dealt with. Now for the vertical axis, again, let's give it a minimum dot value, same of minus 0.5, give it a maximum value. Again, based on what we know about this data, we'll give it 3.5, and we'll give it a label. Okay, so that's our axis taken care of, um, at least the things that we need to set separately for the two axes. Now let's get rid of the border. Set the font. So you've seen this all many times. All right. So now we've cleaned it up a little bit. Let's save it and run it. Okay, so now I've made an error again. What did I do? Okay, so this shouldn't be model, obviously. It should be mode. Alright, so now we can see we're looking a bit better. Now we can clearly see our three mean locations uh, depicted quite nicely with these three dots. Okay, so now what we want to do is add some bootstrapped 95% confidence intervals to these particular dots. Okay, so if you see a, a warning like this, this is just a warning, that's, that's fine, you can ignore that. Okay, so we've already got scipy.stats imported. So as before, let's define our set of subjects as range n per group. Set the number of bootstraps. Now, as part of our condition loop, we're going to do the bootstrapping. So again, we're going to define an empty array and boot. We'll fill it with NANDs. Now we're going to loop over each um, bootstrap. As we did before, we're going to generate a random subject sample. So this is exactly as we did beforehand. We'll store the mean, the data, with our random subject sample, this time only for this particular condition. All right, so now we've generated our 10,000 bootstraps. As we know, we can calculate the lowest CI as percentile Boot data 2.5. Got 
copy and paste it. Upper CI is going to be the same thing, but now the 97.5 percentile. Okay, so now how do we get this CI information into views? So rather than look at the um, lower and upper uh, confidence interval, the way that views um, does these error bars is looks at the, uh, the distance from the mean to these particular values. So let's define something called the positive error will be the distance from the upper CI to the mean and the negative error will be the distance from the lower CI to the mean. So now the way that we tell views about this is by some extra arguments to this set data. So let's format it to be easier to read. So now we're going to define a couple of extra arguments. Pos error, which is going to be the positive error, and neg error, which is going to be the negative error. Okay, so what we've done is for each condition, we've used our bootstrapping method to determine the 95% confidence intervals. Then we've told views um, about the distances of these intervals from the condition mean. So now if we save it and run it, you can see that, okay, I've made a, another error here. Okay, so what I've forgotten to do here is, as I mentioned before, what it set data here is expecting a, a collection of numbers, where I've just give it, given it one number for the positive and negative error. So instead we need to put it in square brackets. Okay, so now if we save it and run it. All right, so now we have our, our figure with these um, lines now that indicate the 95 bootstrapped 95% confidence intervals of these uh, means. Okay, so the figure looks quite nice, but let's make a couple of final tweaks just to make it look even better. So the first thing we're going to do is turn off those labels. So sometimes the labels attached to each data point can be really useful, but here they're probably a bit unnecessary, so we'll hide them. The other thing we're going to do is put a, a white uh, line around each of our points just as a way to sort of delineate it from the um, confidence interval lines. So the way we do that is by setting the marker line's color to be white and we'll also make it a bit larger by setting the marker line dot width val to be two points. Last thing we're going to do is just to make the markers a little bit larger. So we'll set the marker size.val to be four points. All right, so now if we save that and run it. All right, so now you can see we have a, a nice looking figure that depicts um, the mean of our three different conditions along with its um, their 95% confidence intervals. Okay, so going back to our objectives for today. So like I said, this lesson was quite a, a long one, we, but we covered quite a lot of ground. So now you should be able to know how to make a figure with multiple panels, how to calculate these basic descriptive statistics, um, how to um, use box plots to visualize distributions, how we can use this computationally intensive bootstrapping approach to generate uh, confidence intervals using a non-parametric procedure, and how we can create error plots. All right, I'll see you in the next screencast.